Um, hi, uh, I also would like to welcome everybody to this webinar from the American Nuclear Society's Risk-Informed Performance-Based Principles and Policy Committee, RP3C. It's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, it sort of indicates what we are about in a sense. Uh, my name is Prasad Kadambi. I'm the chair of RP3C. The purpose of RP3C is to help uh, modernize ANS standards. Uh, modernization has come to mean use of risk-informed and performance-based methods. Uh, today's webinar introduces the concept of employing a systems engineering framework for enabling use of risk-informed performance-based methods. Uh, the presenter is Kent Welter, and I will let uh, Kent introduce himself. Thank you, Prasad. Um, uh, I, my name is Kent Welter. Um, welcome, and thank you for joining us here um, on Friday uh, afternoon. Um, I uh, work here at New Scale Power. Um, we are a uh, small modular reactor vendor. Um, I'm also uh, a chair of a, a working group chair of ANS uh, 30.3, uh, where, where we've been working for a couple of years to develop um, a uh, uh, RIPB uh, design standard for advanced uh, light water reactors. I'm also a member of uh, RPC3 and um, We'll be uh, supporting Prasad as a coordinator for this community of practice, and the goal is to um, uh, have a, uh, a knowledge share presentation uh, once a month, and this is the first one to, to kick it off. So I will be going through uh, some slides, um, and uh, Pat will be monitoring the Q&A um, through the chat. Uh, function on, on the Zoom meeting, but then also at the end of the slide presentation, I think the idea was to uh, open up the mics um, and answer any questions uh, folks might have. So the goal is to um, uh, have knowledge shares and um, without any purpose other than to visit and discuss uh, RIPB methods and their application uh, in the industry. So today I'll be talking about the importance of systems engineering to support uh, risk-informed performance-based methods. This comes from my experience at New Scale uh, Power as a SMR vendor leading the development of not only systems engineering, but uh, RIPB uh, design tools and methods, um, but also as my experience with uh, as a chair of a working group uh, developing an industry standard in that area as well. So um, next slide. Uh, so the outline. Uh, for today's, today's talk is what is systems engineering, uh, a couple key concepts. Uh, we're we're going to be just touching very, very light touch on systems engineering um, and its value uh, for supporting uh, RIPP methods, a little about tailoring um, uh, design processes and best practices, um, and then how do you effectively uh, manage a systems engineering program with R RIPB methods and then just a, you know, a, a short slide on some additional resources um, for uh, learning more about systems engineering. Next slide, please. So what is systems engineering? Um, there's a, it's really just a set of proven tools and technique, techniques for managing uh, the complexity of large uh, projects and or products. Um, and the, and the, it's, it's a way to get organized. Um, and from a business perspective, it's, it's, to help control cost schedule and quality. On the right, on the right hand side here is um, an Arcadia model based systems engineering method. In the systems engineering world, when you're developing complex products such as airplanes or space shuttles or nuclear power plants, um, we employ um, systematic methods for um, developing uh, needs and requirements at the highest level. And then as you go through more detailed uh, design and testing and deployments, you need to um, have a structure for uh, and a methodology for uh, identifying lower level requirements, allocating those appropriately, um, and tracking them and validating them. And so 
in a systems engineering world, there's many different types of what are called MBSC methods and tools. Um, this picture on the right is just uh, uh, one of the more common ones, the Arcadia methodology. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means uh, in terms of a system V model in a little bit. But uh, um, overall, systems engineering is just a, uh, a way to manage complexity. Uh, let's see. Prasad, hey, did you want to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, say something about this and relate uh, what Kent just said uh, uh, to, I guess, uh, risk informed performance based methods. Uh, to me, one of the key things is how in this picture you see requirements uh, associated with uh, several of the, I mean, with all the different levels. Uh, in this uh, structure. <clears throat> Each level is, uh, it shows amenable to a logical decomposition into uh, what can be seen as the objectives of the, uh, of the lower level, uh, a, you know, to which it is uh, associated. So conceptually, this idea of uh, having structured performance objectives is very important for implementing a performance-based approach. And so uh, to me, uh, this is one of the key associations between systems engineering and a performance-based approach. One way to layer the, these structures is to think of requirements at uh, the enterprise level, the facility level, the systems level, subsystems, and then the component uh, levels. But as we think about requirements, I think one of the key goals is that we, uh, I mean, we do this uh, effort so that there are no unnecessary requirements. This is, in my mind, one of the key um, aspects of uh, employing a uh, risk-informed performance-based uh, set of methods and processes. So go ahead, Kent, next slide. Thank you, Prasad. Um, this is a list to, uh, of uh, international consensus standards related to systems engineering best practices um, from a little bit of a historical context. Um, the systems engineering discipline, or as a separate discipline, engineering discipline, was developed out of uh, mil-spec standards decades ago. Um, and they've um, progressed, and, and um, other organizations, and I'll talk about those at the end, have developed uh, guides. And NASA has a systems engineering handbook, and, and COSI has systems engineering handbooks that are more detailed. And all of these organizations have worked together, both domestically and internationally, over the years to develop consensus standards. So these are some of the resources for organizations to look to develop their own systems engineering management process. Um, and this is where they would start at the highest level. This talks about the what, the why, um, and then uh, they do, uh, ISO does provide uh, here um, some parts one through six on more detailed um, guidance. Um, for some specific areas uh, like uh, software development and systems integration and lifecycle management. So this is a good, if folks are looking to learn more about it and start uh, developing a systems engineering um, program within their organization, this is where they should start. Next slide. This is a, another key concept of uh, systems engineering. You'll find many different um, uh, variations of what's called a system V model and very many variations of a system life cycle model. So that first um, part of the figure is a life cycle model uh, of a product or a system where on the far left you're starting with some sort of a preconceptual or conceptual design and then as you move through that product's life cycle you end with its retirement. Uh, when developing a complex system, it's important that you define uh, these life cycle phases. Um, and it's also important that you um, identify, as you're going through these life cycle phases, um, the necessary performance uh, objectives and requirements. And you can see the, the other dimension, if you kind of think about it, as you're going through a technology development phase, 
the system V model uh, provides a structured approach for um, identifying those performance requirements, starting at the left with the highest level in terms of uh, concepts of operations and what are your customers and what are your business needs. And as you go through the design process, you're starting to uh, make decisions uh, and solutions about the design. And then you're starting to uh, create more specific requirements. In the context of RIPV methods, um, the, 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 the safety goals and the methodologies um, that you would uh, include in this entire requirements set, um, it's important to understand how those requirements get assigned to a structure at what level of the product uh, you're going to uh, assign those performance objectives. Prasad mentioned before of having a hierarchy where you might have RIPB performance goals at a high level, but then as you go down in the design process, you may be assigning or allocating those goals or creating new ones um, at system component or subsystem level as well. So it's important from a systems engineering perspective to define product life cycle phases that helps with project planning. It's also important as you're developing the technology to step through a structured process for defining your performance objectives and then validating them to ensure at the end of the day on that far right that you're delivering a product that meets the requirements and the performance objectives you specified. Prasad, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, yeah, I, I'd like to just, uh, uh, you know, add a, a couple of thoughts uh, based on what we've been trying to do at RP3C for the last uh, a couple of meetings. Uh, one of the things that I'm trying to bring in is uh, uh, to consider design, construction, and operation uh, as a continuum. If you view it as a continuum, you see on this uh, slide at the top how you know all the different uh, phases are related, and what happens in one can affect uh, you know uh, others all the way down down the line. And uh, of course, the uh, the structure of the V diagram uh, can also be viewed. Uh, you know, uh, the enterprise, facility, system, subsystem, and component uh, levels. So this is again uh, amenable to the hierarchical uh, uh, presentations that become important with a performance-based uh, approach. Uh, the other thing about a performance-based approach is that it emphasizes monitoring of key parameters and uh, you know this picture shows the right side of the v for example you know paying attention to monitoring and uh, verification and validation of the observations so uh, to me there's a very natural uh, relationship between uh, ripb and uh, the system life cycle v model so next slide thank you prasad Next slide. So what is systems engineering? We, we um, talked a little bit about some key concepts visually. Um, uh, when you're implementing a systems engineering process as an organization, you need to talk about sort of the enabling processes uh, related to systems engineering. And you'll see in different handbooks and guidance um, them talked about a little differently. But these, these processes essentially help you get organized and help you deliver and manage a complex process, a product uh, through a system V type of uh, development cycle. Um, in the three main areas are system design, uh, technical management and control, and product realization. I just put this here um, to identify that we're gonna talk about uh, and give some, some practical uh, or some case studies, at least for a new scale, um, where when you're implementing RIPB methods into an organization, which one of these processes do you need to modify and which one of these processes do you need to have to make sure that your implementation of your RIPB method uh, is, is successful. So I just want to give a broad kind of overview of the systems engineering processes and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, a couple of these that are super important um, uh, like decision analysis and uh, configuration management and requirements engineering. Next slide. 
this is a typical uh, pyramid of requirement set uh, where you start with uh, your mission statement and your concept of operations. Uh, from that, you start to uh, at which uh, develop custom, customer requirements and system technical requirements. And it's typically within that customer requirements and system technical requirements, you're starting to develop risk informed performance based goals and attributes. Um, those will eventually need to flow down into the detailed technical requirements um, for those systems and allocated appropriately. Now, some um, high level uh, RIPB requirements don't uh, really uh, allow themselves to be easily allocated. And so that's where it takes a little bit of the subject matter experts working with the designers to understand um, how these requirements are going to be implemented and where if they're going to be a goal or a requirement, which is my next slide. Uh, you go to the next I'd slide. Like to Did just, you have? Uh, yeah. I, I go back to uh, one slide. Yep, yeah, sure. Yep. Uh, I, I, I just want to point out that this picture also uh, depicts uh, one of the important things about this uh, hierarchical. Uh, representation that uh, that I think um, enables visualizing, uh, you know, the goals and objectives um, uh, that are important to systems engineering. Uh, it, it shows a logical decomposition and disaggregation, and also shows that functional analysis is important uh, uh, as as part of. Uh, formulating performance objectives, you know. So uh, I, I just thought I'd point it out as a relation to uh, risk-informed performance base. Next slide. Thank you, Prasad. So as you're de developing your risk-informed performance base objectives, and you will need to, to Prasad's uh, point about tracking them, we need to, uh, for those that can be quantified, um, as uh, uh, key performance indicators, um, we need to understand um, how these targets are being set. Some quantified targets for um, like reliability uh, are more goals. You want to um, uh, maximize the capacity uh, of your plant, the capacity factor, um, and you also want to minimize the unavailability factor. Um, those are not necessarily the same things, and it's important to understand in a design process um, that not only if this is a goal, which is something that needs to be maximized, minimized, and optimized, but if it's a hard requirement as well, and the directionality of that goal. So as we're developing um, not only all of the different performance targets for a plant, but specifically the ones related to risk-informed performance-based design, we need to be very careful as we're implementing them um, how, uh, how hard are these? Are these uh, requirements that have to be met exactly? Uh, is a range of requirements um, or are these goals that need to be maximized or optimized? That's super important because as we're designing a plant and you're doing, say, example, the, the PRA analysis to inform decision making, um, do you always want to drive CDF down or LERF down or what, what is your target? And for advanced LWRs, you always have these low targets and so it's a very important um, to consider um, whether or not these are goals versus requirements in the design process. Kent, uh, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, jump in here a minute and, and say that uh, on this slide, I think uh, uh, what uh, struck me is uh, how optimization you know, requires a range of acceptability uh, as a consideration. And um, the, the range needs to be associated with uh, a, an allowable margin. A, you know, and when we are talking about safety, uh, safety margins uh, and uh, a, a, a range of, uh, you know, acceptable safety performance uh, that occurs over a range is, is something that, uh, again, you know, is uh, the, a, a formal performance-based approach uh, considers that to be um, an important aspect of implementing a performance-based approach. Yes. Yes, I agree completely with that. Um, 
Next okay, slide. thank you, Prasad. Next slide. Product structure modeling. Um, it's important um, as as folks are developing complex products to, as early as practical, start developing a product structure. Um, this is an example from a Finnish research organization, VPT, specifically for a nuclear power plant. Um, uh, for those that are designing the power plants like New Scale. Um, and it's important to identify um, the different elements of a nuclear power plant, which is not just systems. And I guess that's what I'd like to highlight here is that when we think of developing a system, um, we start thinking about, uh, you know, cores and fuels and pressure vessels and all that, and, and CVCS, all those important systems to support the safety and power operation. But in a full systems engineering and RIPB approach, you need to identify the area uh, of where those systems are going to be located and the organizational units that are going to be um, interacting with those systems. And so this um, is really important to uh, identify that the overall product, like say for a nuclear power plant, includes not just the physical systems and the buildings, but the people that are gonna be operating as well. And they have their own performance objectives that need to be integrated with the mechanical, electrical, and control systems. Um, next slide. Okay, so we talked a little bit about some high-level concepts of systems engineering. Um, now, now why, why are we doing that for the context of RIPV methods? Well, when, as a vendor um, who uh, is implementing risk-informed, performance-based processes, um, what uh, we have found, and uh, it's not, I don't think, unique, is that, uh, and is also someone who's chairing and writing a standard um, in this area, is that you can have a lot of great ideas about how to implement RIP, RIPB methods and principles into the design process. What we have found, and I think what most people will find, is if you don't have a robust systems engineering infrastructure already set up to receive that kind of um, standard, uh, you, you have a very hard time implementing RIPB methods. And, and, and so, for example, RIP, RIPB methods and, and standards that are being developed, not just as ANS 30.3, focus on things like requirements engineering and management, in terms of making sure you're defining the right risk and safety requirements. It talks about risk-informed decision-making, making sure you're making the right decisions. It talks about you know, configuration management, uh, making sure you know where everything is and they're being allocated uh, correctly, and technical assessment, which is doing a, um, as a generic term for evaluating the technical adequacy of your product. And I should have put another bullet under there, but a lot of standards talk about defense and in depth adequacy evaluation. So as you're developing your product, how effective is your defense in depth? And you want to do that on a periodic basis to determine if you're meeting your RIPB goals, if you will. That's a, a common way to do that. But again, if you don't have a good decision-making process set up, it's really hard to do risk-informed decision-making. If you don't have a good requirements engineering management program set up, it's really hard to get the right risk-informed performance-based requirements into the design. And if you don't have a solid process for technical assessment, identifying key performance parameters, you can't do effective defense and depth adequacy evaluations. So this is more from the practical implementation side when folks are developing RAPB standards is to um, try to pay homage to or try to understand from the user side that they might say a lot of great things, but unless that organization has SE understanding and infrastructure, they, they probably will have a very difficult time implementing uh, some of these more advanced RAPB methods. Okay, uh, Kent, I'll just uh, jump in here and uh, 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 the previous slide, please. Uh, there you go. Um, let, let me just say that, uh, you know, I see a connection between systems engineering and standards because systems engineering introduces requirements engineering and management as, uh, as Kent has uh, a, you know, uh, has uh, described it as, as an important part of it. And standards are all about specifying requirements. Uh, and and uh, it's also a matter of 
assuring conformity with the uh, with the requirements. So, uh, in a sense, uh, you know, the whole range of uh, standards application uh, is 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 a part of the requirements engineering and uh, and management. On decision making, uh, the structured set of performance objectives. Uh, is ideally suited for integrated decision making, you know, which is what uh, 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 we are finding is very uh, important. Uh, for example, the work on the uh, licensing modernization uh, project uh, shows how for uh, defense in depth uh, assessment, you need um, uh, you know, you need to have uh, integrated decision making. Let's see, are you able to hear me? I mean, uh, I'm still on the previous slide. Um, Prasad, do you want me to move to the next slide? Uh, no, just the, the previous slide, please. Okay. Uh, no. The, I just want to mention something about uh, the previous one. Yeah, I, again, I, you know, Kent also addressed this, but the technical assessment is, is important because uh, as, as we specify requirements uh, during the, the performance of design, uh, the assessment results, uh, I, you know, that uh, are, to be had from the monitoring of operational performance, you know, is also important. So the operational observations, uh, you know, uh, uh, should be confirming uh, all the assumptions that are made during the design phase. So uh, this is, uh, I, I think, uh, an important aspect of the technical assessment. Okay, next slide. So ta tailoring and best practices. So I, I mentioned a little bit, there's ISO standards, there's other um, bodies uh, and organizations that provide a lot of good guidance on, on systems engineering best practices. Um, it's important for organizations to um, evaluate that body of knowledge, but then tailor um, a systems engineering program to the needs of their organization for the needs of that life cycle. For example, as a um, as, a, as an early end SSS vendor, we don't have any plants operating right now. Um, we need to consider uh, operational requirements in the design process, um, but that's different than having requirements for actual operation. So systems engineering programs need to develop the infrastructure and the processes uh, for the organization and how they do business and for that life cycle. Now, Prasad mentioned integrated decision making, and that's decision making is one of the most important things that an organization can do. Um, so uh, implementing integrated decision making is, 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 is challenging. If you think back to any organization you've been a part of, you think that that organization have a clear, written down, formal, executed process for decision making? Um, I would contend very few do. Um, but um, so it's tough. It's tough to maybe implement some of these ideas and, and concepts of risk-informed integrated decision making if that organization itself doesn't have a great process for decision making, but we can help, right? As systems engineering and risk uh, practitioners um, and safety analysts, uh, we can help an organization to improve their decision making. Um, and uh, one size does not fit all. Um, at New Scale, uh, our our integrated decision making um, in practice is based upon what's called a CM2 Enterprise Configuration Management Program, which is an industry best practice for enterprise. Uh, decision making across everything. It includes it's not just uh, evaluating RIPB decisions, but enterprise level decisions. So those are the kinds of things that organizations need to have and set up to do effective integrated decision making. And you need to work closely with outside experts um, and internal change leaders if you want to effectively implement RIPB methods. Right? You, you have a standard out there, a new standard is being developed. You say, I want to do that. All right. Well, you need to have you need to work with the experts and you need to work with the internal change leaders to develop these plans to how to get you where you want to go. Um, I think the, the nuclear industry as a whole can learn a lot from other industries on systems engineering best practices. A lot of the um, just my frank opinion is a lot of the best practices on systems engineering are not in the nuclear industry. They're in aerospace. They're in defense. 
Um, and so I, I think we can learn a ton um, from these other industries um, and learn how to uh, manage, uh, complex, manage and deploy complex uh, projects uh, more effectively, including risk-informed, performance-based uh, principles and methods, which is a super sort of important part and specific to our industry that we need to take care of. Uh, next slide. Uh, let's see. Let, let me just. Uh, I'd like to make yep. one point on uh, on this slide. Okay. Uh, a, sure. A new reactor developer who wants to set up a systems engineering framework. I think it is important for them to think about working with standards developing organizations, uh, and to let consensus standards specify as many requirements as possible. Uh, because, you know, if the consensus standard uh, is endorsed by the regulator, then it becomes uh, much uh, easier uh, for the licensing process. So I, I think this is where, you know, uh, I urge uh, the new reactor developers to actively participate, uh, you know, uh, with SDOs, specifically with the American Nuclear Society, I'd like to say and uh, help us, uh, you know, develop uh, modern uh, standards. Thank you. Go ahead. Thanks, Chris. I mean, that's a, I would second that as a, um, a new reactor vendor. Um, it's, it's super important that the new designers get involved in the standards, not only to understand them, but then to help shape them um, uh, in, in a way that's going to be effective for that uh, eventual uh, approval of that design and deployment. So completely agree. Um, I only have two more slides, effective program management. So after um, a systems engineering program is set up, it, it goes through phases. You usually get an initial setup of an SE program um, and then it, and it's care and feeding. You need, it's usually not as large as it needs to be. And so it needs to be actively managed. And um, Initially, the programs focus on supporting one or two products, and then they, they grow to support the entire enterprise. Systems engineering resources really do need to be planned and tracked. Um, there's a number of, uh, of studies out there that show as you increase, that there's an optimum amount of systems engineering resources to spend on a project, and it's about 15 to 14% of your total project. Now, a lot of those uh, estimates are not things that you're not planning already for a technology development product. They're things like specifying requirements, doing verification and validation, doing testing. All of those things have to be done, but making sure that those are planned holistically and they work together um, and that that amount of effort is being tracked um, so that you can help identify additional uh, program expansions or reductions per life cycle phase is super important. So systems engineering is um, not a one and done, it's a constant effort, and it goes hand in hand with also the deployment of your RIPB methods um, uh, as well. So, Prasad, anything on that before I go to the last slide? No, no, I'm done. All right, last slide. Just I, I spoke to these a few more, and folks can Google these, and, and I'm, I'm sure these are familiar with, uh, already familiar with, uh, there are the ISO standards, IEEE consensus standards. INCOSI is the International Council of Systems Engineers. Um, NASA has a, has a great handbook that's free online. Uh, there's a lot of how-to guidance for implementing SE practices. And if you look at that, um, it, 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 you can see how RIPB methods fit into those categories and those topics that are in the NASA handbook and in the INCOSI handbook. I personally... Uh, like the NASA handbook better these days, and COSI has took more of a enterprise-wide approach, but if you're developing, if you're an engineer and you're developing a complex product, I find the NASA guide is a good start for tailoring. The DOD and DOE processes for systems engineering are also a good resource, but what you'll find, I think, is that they're very much um, uh, uh, peppered with organizational um, sort of requirements uh, throughout the the systems engineering um, uh, life cycle. So for example, if you need to go from one phase of development from the next, you need the signature of this person in the DOD or the DOE. So it has a lot of good uh, information, but it's, it's very uh, tailored already to those uh, specific organizations. I'll give a plug to IPX, which is a um, business management uh, uh, consulting company that we use. And, and they take 
and, and go in and set up business systems, including systems engineering and the CM2 process for a wide range of industries. And that's, those are the kinds of organizations that have helped us here as a nuclear vendor understand all of the good best practices and lessons learned of implementing these types of processes on a wide range of industries. So I think it's super important to have uh, that kind of input into the process. So that's all I have today. Uh, it's a very quick sort of rundown on systems engineering. And, and I think the, the summary, I didn't, I didn't put a summary slide in here, but the purpose of this presentation was to kind of kick off uh, this community of practice um, and, and hope to generate some interest for some, some more presentations from other folks on different topics. Um, but it was really to share the experience from New Scale and my personal experience of developing RIPB methods and trying to implement them in a real life situation and finding the, the trouble of trying to implement these methods without having an SE infrastructure and the importance of that SE infrastructure to effective implementation of RIPB methods. So thank you for listening and happy to take any questions. Um, Kent, I do have two questions. Uh, the first question is from Steve Nisbet. It said, can you give a couple of examples of RIPB applications in the new scale design which were enabled by a systems engineering approach? Uh, specific applications. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I'll pick a, um, one is uh, decision engineering change. I'll, uh, so I'm gonna put in the title, title of decision making and engineering change control and um, defense and depth adequacy evaluation. So as I sit on the engineering change board here at New Scale, and as we're uh, you know, evaluating changes to the design or operation of the plant, we need to evaluate that against qualitative and quantitative metrics. And so, but how, how do you do that? And so it's, it's important we have, uh, you know, develop a checklist uh, for defense and depth that says as we're, if we're faced with a decision, what are those defense and depth adequacy metrics are we gonna evaluate to help us make a better decision? And so it's, implementing RIPB methods actually is not necessarily super um, difficult, but it's making sure you have the right type of form or information available to the decision makers in the process that they're using. So um, that's just an example of using like a DID checklist uh, for an engineering change control board. And, and if that's uh, an example I have right off the top of my head. Okay, um, I'm going to try and open up uh, the phone line for Steve Nisbet just to confirm that that answers his question. Um, Steve, are you able to confirm? I should have unmuted you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I was wondering if there was some specific uh, applications um, sort of that we could get our hands around, you know, things that we might recognize from, uh, um, you know, nuclear power reactor practice and stuff like that, where there was a, a particular RIPB method uh, employed in the design. Employed in the design, yeah. I mean, when you look, like for example, when you're looking at um, the standard ANS 30.3 that we're developing, it has, um, you know, 10 sections. It has, you know, defining the RIPB goals and requirements through a systems engineering process. It has conducting the PRA, doing deterministic safety analysis. Um, it has integrated decision making. It has programmatic defense in depth, defense in depth adequacy evaluations, and et cetera. So at New Scale, uh, we, ha we do PRA, we do deterministic safety analysis, we do defense in depth adequacy evaluations. Um, and all, all of that stuff, though, really for us, other, you know, PRA is, you have to do PRA for some reasons, you know, for specific reasons, you need deterministic safety analysis or fission product barrier performance. You have to do those separately when, uh, for their own purposes. But when, what we really need RIBB methods to do is bring that type of information together to support better decisions. And um, so a lot of the focus of our implementation of RIPB methods is um, defining um, actual performance objectives like core damage frequency, large release frequency, um, 
uh, a number of risk significant systems, the costs associated with augmented quality requirements for systems important to safety. And, and it's the whole thing, it's holistic. You have to define those requirements well. You have to do assessments to validate those requirements. And as you make decisions, you have to put that information um, to the decision makers as they're evaluating potential changes. Because as a, as a technology developer, we're faced with many decisions every day on should we go left or should we go right, and we need to have current up-to-date information um, about the PA results and deterministic safety analysis and sort of accident evaluations to make good decisions about the design. Yeah, I guess I was interested in if there was a couple of one or two design outcomes you could point to that said because we employed risk-informed performance-based methods, you know, we ended up here instead of there where we would have been uh, maybe if we were doing this 25 years ago. Because I, I recognize that, you know, the licensing framework for new scale is essentially the standard light water reactor licensing framework. So I guess I wasn't expecting a lot of uh, differences there in terms of design outcomes. I think the you know, the emergency power being one of them that everybody knows about, but I just wondered if there were some lower level examples that you could point to. Mm. Yeah, I don't think anything specific. We have a big old long list of risk insights, which is a little bit different. Um, design outcomes, um, I don't know if anything specifically interesting. We're, when we're looking at um, in-vessel retention um, for, uh, you know, severe accidents, um, we were doing um, a lot of analysis to kind of support that and looking at, you know, some interesting design choices associated with that. Um, oh, I know one. So when we're doing, um, this is more on the programmatic side, EPZ uh, methodology. So we uh, set an early, uh, a, a requirement early on to have a site boundary emergency planning zone for plume exposure pathway. And that's what I would consider a, you know, a quantifiable performance objective that drove our design. Um, so we set that early, but we needed to develop a, a, a method for evaluating um, potential design changes. And so one example that I don't think is proprietary at all is when we went early in our design process, we looked at our reactor building and said, well, we could, um, you know, maybe add a, add a dry spray system in our reactor building. It's not a containment. And then, you know, maybe that would provide additional defense and depth uh, for helping us meet our site boundary EPZ. Um, we did some work and, did, and initially we put it in, um, but as we sharpened our pencil and looked more at the design, we realized we didn't need that. And so we came back and said, well, we, you know, because of the way that we're implementing our RIP methods, our decision making, we need, to, we need to go ahead and take that out. And so I guess that's a specific application of we developed a, a, a risk informed RIPB EPZ sizing methodology, and we went through some design changes early on to evaluate what needs to go in and what needs to go out. Okay, thanks, appreciate that. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, Kent, I have another question for you, and that is from Jordan Hageman. He said, at what point in the design process did New Scale introduce the SE framework, that being preconceptual, conceptual, or detailed design? That's a great question. The short answer is not early enough, <laughs> I think. Um, uh, we, we had a informal SE program quite early in our design process, but to be quite honest, uh, we didn't implement a formal structured SE program uh, until most of the reactor was designed. So we implemented the principles of it, but we didn't formalize it until um, in the last several years. Um, and that's because we realized very quickly um, that as we're getting into more detailed and detailed design, um, our processes for configuration management and tracking and identifying requirements was just our existing processes was not effective. And if we're going to start um, as, as, a, as vendors, it had more to do with multiple product configurations is why we needed to implement it so effectively and quickly is that we might be building one plant here in the U.S., um, and maybe a couple plants in the U.S. that look very similar, but as soon as we go out with this modular design to Canada, Japan, the U.K., very quickly you start dealing with regulators and, and organizations that want to change things. And you might have slight different product variants, and so you need to be able to, and, and maybe different risk goals, right? So we very quickly were having multiple uh, needs for multiple um, 
uh, product management configurations, and you just couldn't do that with a, a, a an informal SE framework. So that's why we needed to. We really pushed hard, and we're still developing. We're it's not done. Uh, we're still adding to that SE resources now and, and growing it to uh, manage multiple products and multiple deployments around the world. Um, Jordan, you should be unmuted. Um, can you confirm that that answers your question? Hey, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, that That's uh, very interesting to hear. And to be honest, that's uh, what I expected to hear you say. And my um, concern is, is, is there any state of practice where uh, robust systems engineering was available at the very beginning of a design and we actually created the design in this ideal way. I, I, it actually makes a lot of sense to me that you need to go through a lot of the rough and informal iterations to get a product and then go through the pain of putting that product into systems engineering to maintain it. But the uh, the, the practice of, of going from nothing to a fully actualized design, um, it, it, it seems like systems engineering might constrain that process. That's a great follow-up question. And what the, uh, yes. And so um, I'm going to say yes and no at the same time. Yes, putting in a formal large systems engineering program to manage the development of a, you know, billion dollar development project like on day one will kill it, right? Too much configuration management. So there is uh, a series of standards that I didn't list that are for systems engineering light. Um, and therefore it's that smaller part of the project, that initial preconceptual design phase. And that's what we do here. So we actually have a flagship product, which is our 12 module plan, but we're developing other products. And we are definitely making sure at the beginning of those product development activities that we start to do systems engineering right. Now, what you'll find, which I think is fascinating, is you start to develop things like product concept documents and plant technical requirements documents and operational concepts and focus early on how the system is going to operate and enabled in an environment and not what's the core going to look like. You'll, you'll find very much quicker that that's a bad or good product. And so what you'll fi I find just personally is being involved in many reactor designs, concepts, either peripheral or directly over the years, is like almost all of them are starting with a certain technology, right? And, it, and then you're figuring out how to take technology and deploy it. If you're doing a good job early defining your customer requirements and performance objectives and technology um, validation plans early in that process, I think you'll find people will know that they're going to fail sooner rather than later. And that's the importance of systems engineering is to know your requirements, know your constraints uh, as quickly as possible so you can either adjust your design or adjust your deployment scenarios to match that. I find very often too much we're just designing reactors and not really considering enough on how they're going to operate and how the customer is going to use them. And that's the value of systems engineering early. And so you, you do need to do systems engineering early, but it's a different type of systems engineering uh, products and practices at the very beginning phase. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I Question think I have everyone unmuted um, right now, and I didn't see any other questions. Um, oh, yeah, there is a let me comment. see. There is one more. It said, um, an anonymous attendee said, I note that at least one of the advanced reactor vendors is implementing system engineering at the front end of their design. Fantastic. <laughs> I think that's tremendous. Uh, you know, this is, uh, although we compete with other folks, I generally believe the more we can share on systems engineering and, 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 and standards and new standards as a community will just help. So I applaud the vendors for implementing that early, and I think that's the right thing to do. And uh, I would like to invite this advanced reactor vendor who's doing this to please uh, you know, plan to share at least what you can share uh, with this community of practice at some point, uh, perhaps during this year, you know, and if you're willing to do so, just reach out to me and we'll arrange for that. So it sounds like we have answered all the questions. Um, 
And I did get a request from uh, Ernestine Johnson Turnipseed to share with her the presentation and I will do that and um, I can share the presentation with anyone else uh, if they would like to uh, request a copy, if uh, you would like to send an email to me uh, at my email address, if you already know that, or you can do it generically at standards at ans.org. Yeah, and then just a note, Pat, uh, from a new scale, this is a fully public presentation with no, okay. uh, no restrictions from our site. So. Perfect, thank you. And I can also post it on maybe RP3C site um, if that is amenable to you and to Prasad. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, think about how we um, integrate the community of practice uh, presentations and experience with the RP3C um, section of the ANS uh, standards website. But, yeah. Sure, that sounds uh, yeah, good. We, we can work that off. Out. Yeah. yeah, we can work on that offline. Right. Um, so again, thanks all. Um, thank you, Kent, uh, for doing a fantastic job, and Pat for your help. And uh, again, we can okay. sign off now. Well, thank you all very much. You have a good weekend. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.